email in front of the, the, the wasp, uh, the wasp at the observatory. Did you see that? No, I didn't. Uh, uh, Mark sent an email uh, recently. It'll have some attachments. There's some photos of the guy who did stuff. So oh, really? It might be fun to show. Okay. Oh. Just so people know that we're still doing stuff. Well, How about I do it at the break? Because I got I got to start. That that's not okay. Great. I, I'll do that at the break. We ready to go? Yeah, we are live. Hello. All right. We're gonna get the show started. Hello. Well, I don't have a. I don't have a speaker here. Darn it. Black turn mic. Um, Lecture and mic testing. Time. There we go. All right. All right. So we're ready to go. Welcome, everyone, to this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. We're going to get this show on the road here. Um, I'm your president, Bob Trumbly. Happy October, everyone. As, as a public service announcement, I'd like to remind everyone that Halloween and the Thanksgiving occur before Christmas, as do our elections and our holiday banquet. Um, we have it drives me nuts seeing how uh, Christmas stuff out before the Halloween. Just, it's a thing. So we have officer elections coming up uh, at next month's Cranbrook meeting. Oh, is it too loud? Testing, testing. How's that? Okay. Okay. So we have officer elections coming up at the next Cranbrook meeting. Several members are being term limited. I can mute this. Uh, several members are being term limited out of their positions, and we have several current board members who are willing to swap roles, but as I mentioned in our award-winning newsletter, we'd really love to see some new faces on the board. Yeah, we... You need to turn off the speaker when you're yeah, on. All right. All right, testing, there we go, all right. So, um, yeah, there we go, okay, so... We currently do not have enough nominees for each office in red in my notes here. So uh, we're still on order. Oh, it's this thing. I've got too many speakers. Shut up. There we go. Okay. Okay, so Mark, Ed, Mark Kedzier will be acting as our nominating committee chair. If you'd like to nominate someone or yourself, See Mark Kedzier now or before, yeah, but now or before the next meeting. So, do we have any first time attendees tonight? No oh, first time before. Her, we have her. Hi there. How'd you hear about us? You heard it through him. Okay, well, that, that's good. All righty then. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to do our roll call here. This is where we go around to say who you are and what you're doing and, and, and that kind of stuff. I'm Bob Tremblay, the president. And uh, let's start with. You um, <laughs> this day, oh my gosh, all right thank you all for coming all right so astronomy at the beach was a great success we had 1200 people on friday and about over 2000 on saturday i'd like to yeah, so the the the, the uh, club tent was packing up about 7, 30, 8 o'clock. It was just crazy. So I'd like to thank our members for showing up who ran the table and our scopes in the field. And thanks to Jeff McLeod for running his Mercury simulator and yeah. Gemini simulator, damn it. Sorry. <coughs> um. The one thing that became apparent is Jeff needs a gopher or somebody to uh, take over for him for a few minutes so he can do the human things that he needs to do. So we will, we will get you, we will get you some help on that. So again, speaking of uh, astronomy at the beach, the Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs organizes 
uh, astronomy at the beach. Their elections are in their January meeting, and there's a good chance there will be numerous board members of the GLAC group that need uh, uh, filling. So if you're interested in helping run astronomy at the beach, uh, I'd suggest joining their Zoom meetings. We're going to have uh, at least two before next year, and the next one should be a post-mortem for uh, the previous event. So that, that will be interesting. We have two more Metro Park events coming up. These are Night of the Dragon events and they're going to be huge and they would like as many people as they can get. We've got October 7th at Indian Springs Metro Park and October 21st at Stony Creek. I will likely be at both of them. They're looking for as many scopes and attendees as they can get. And Cranbrook here has asked for help with the annual eclipse on October 14th. So please let us know if you can help here uh, outside on the event. First contact here starts at 11.46 a.m. So we should be set up no later than about 11.30. Um, we won't be seeing the annular here. We'll be seeing a partial here. And it a partial solar, well, here it'll be a partial solar. Way out west, it'll be an annular, which is the moon doesn't quite cover the entire face of the sun. So you have a, a ring around the moon. We won't be seeing that. We'll be, seeing, we'll be seeing the moon taking a bite out of the sun here. Our banquet is being held at the Ukrainian Cultural Center, Monday, December 11th from 6 to 11 p.m. John Blum, former president, will be the keynote speaker. Price is $35 per plate up until uh, December Cranbrook, $40 at the door. Um, so let's get into officer reports. Um, well, I just I just gave my officer report. I, I, I'll, I'll let Dale go next. Dale? First vice president. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to say that uh, we have, quite frankly, a lot of speakers booked to give presentations, uh, except we need more short presentations. Uh, these would be 10 or 15 minute presentations. So those are the easy ones. So if anyone has a nugget of an idea of something you'd like to talk about, uh, let me know. Um, should I say something about treasure stuff? Sure. Okay. I'm kind of uh, deputized for tonight to be uh, assistant treasurer because Adrian couldn't make it tonight. So I'll be sitting down here. Uh, I don't have the treasures money box, so I can't make change. Uh, but if you'd like to pay for the banquet that's coming up in December, uh, it's $35 if you pay in advance per ticket, it's $40 at the door. I can take money for that. Or if you'd like to buy a calendar, we've got them here, they're $15. Um, what else, there's something else. Calendar election. Uh, yeah, if you'd like to pay your dues <clears throat> for next year, uh, it's thirty dollars for a regular membership. <clears throat> it's uh, twenty-two dollars for a senior, anyone sixty years old or older, and it's uh, seventeen dollars if you're a student. Um, I'm actually a student, but I'm paying the senior rate anyhow. <laughs> Uh, and if it's a family membership, add $7 to any of the above. So see me at the break if you'd like to pay for any of those things. You can also pay online using PayPal, okay? And I don't have change, so I can take the exact amount of cash or a check. Thank you. Thanks. Jeff? Anybody else's allergy has been going crazy the last couple of days? Oh, oh yeah, it, it is just me. All right, I'm going to have to get some. Uh, I don't really know how the open house went. I was at Astronomy at the Beach. Riyad said it went well. I think they had pretty good skies, but not fantastic because uh, they just pulled out the little dob. Can you hear me? What? All right. Okay. Because I'll yell at you guys if you want me to. We got a lot of problems. Um, 
All right, so yeah, open house went well. Astronomy to Beach went great. Um, I'd like to thank all of our volunteers that helped out at the table. Who do I see? Mike O'Dowd, Laura Wade, Bob, Dale. John Blum was TV, there for a while. John Blum uh, and my Dob people, Marty, Mark. She's, I don't see her. Uh, Natalia. Natal um, and then uh, David Baranski. Oh, he was out there. And I feel like I'm missing someone else, so my apologies. Oh, uh, Greg, our driver, also doesn't come to the meetings, but comes to the open houses. Uh, we got it done. Uh, the scope is back at the observatory. It's parked. We got some other stuff going on there. We have a enormous hornet's nest that we got taken care of uh, yesterday, or no, this morning. This very morning, uh, guy said he'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> so, uh, we'll it was inside the dob shed. It was about a sixty. I mean, it was like from stud to stud, sixteen wow. inches across, just oh. enormous. Um, so, Mark and I got the pleasure of uh, taking most of the stuff out of the shed. I kind of don't want to put it all back. So, there's a chance that some scopes might be going up for sale soon we're going to take an inventory we just we're getting a noah's ark of telescopes we don't need two of every kind okay <laughs> um uh what else is going on uh elections i'm currently the observatory chair i'm going on as the outreach chair Riyadh is going to come back as the observatory chair but i want to make a plea uh for y'all to to help out the club we sometimes uh, don't make board positions look glamorous, but um, I've actually gotten a lot of, you know, personal joy out of working with this club. And notice how long I've been on the board. Almost a decade. Yeah. Uh, I have discretionary funds as the observatory manager, so I'm going to say right now, you run for board, I'm going to get you a calendar for free. <laughs> Um, here first. What else is going on? So the the next open house is fourth Saturday. Um, I believe it's twenty eighth. Uh, there's also October seventh and eighth is the Plain Wave open house out in Adrian, Michigan. Uh, we should probably advertise it pretty soon here because it's this weekend. Uh, but if you're interested, it's kind of a hype. It's like an hour. Wasn't that and, uh, I think it was. I think it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Plain Wave. Uh, Cranbrook has a plane wave in their observatory. Uh, plane wave is now based in Michigan. Uh, they used to be out in California. Internet people. All right. Uh, I think that's all I've got. We have a hand. I will here. see you later. Chat. Yeah. Um, I don't see it, Dale. Oh, there it is. Victor. So, Victor, do you want to say something? I yes, something? I wanted to say something. Thank you. Um, so, I was wondering if two of those telescopes were were used for um, stereo, like binoculars, stereo or three D imaging. Uh, two of those, you know, the telescopes that are that are exactly like each other. Um, could those be used in that sense? Most, most telescopes, you know, you only look through one eyepiece with one eye, but, um, you know. Now, these, are, these, are all, or... these are all totally separate scopes, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah these are these are all individual scopes. Yeah, right? yeah. So two of them put together, you know, kind of yeah. duct tape two of them together, you know. You would have to, um, you would have oh. to build that. <laughs> Watch the planet and the stars and everything in 3D. Come on. Use your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay. no, that's, that's that's just a thought. Thanks. Okay, so uh let's see. Adrian is not here, but the treasury report is in our newsletter. Uh secretary, the newsletter is in the newsletter. Oh, he's gonna come up talk. Okay. Oh, our secretary is now our swag guy, and he's got some cool stuff. Oh, oh. I like this. We have uh, at every Cranbrook meeting, I will be here and uh, we can order your swag. Okay, we got a few different emblems. You can do it on the front, you do a front and the back. Uh, if you have possibly your own garment that you would like to have 
an imprint on, bring it in, and I have the prices and everything for it. Take the orders at the Cranbrook meeting, and you'll have it delivered to you at the next Cranbrook meeting. Okay. Uh, t-shirts, long, long sleeve t-shirts. We have uh, crew neck sweaters, and right now uh, we'll do some zip up hoodies. And we're right now I'm in the market for looking for like uh, like jackets, uh, both lined and unlined. If you have any suggestions, see me at the break and we take your orders. Hey Mark, any idea what we talk? Uh, I have all the prices. T-shirts are 15. Some of the sweaters are in the 20 some dollar range. The zippered hoodies are like in the about $30 or so. Uh, some of the colors, uh, two X's are a little bit more, three X's are a little bit more, okay. But this is small through extra large. Um, there are some the zippered hoodies. Uh, if you get like a, a black is probably like in the 20, $28 range. But if you go to gray, like uh, this kind of gray right here, it jumps up $5. It's just based on what they sell and what they have in stock and everything. But we're still exploring, trying to find the best prices, but this is what I can get right now. But I have the price list if you want to check with me at break. Okay. All right. Thank you. And the wasp be dead. Not the, new, not the newsletter. The wasps are dead. Yeah, not the newsletter. The newsletter is doing just fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Outreach. Kevin here. I pretty much covered outreach again. We've got this two. Uh, the, the, the next Metro Park event on the 7th and um, Cranbrook on the 14th. So get with us if you'd like to uh, attend those. Um, so astronomy in the news. Uh, there's a new version of Stellarium. I got an email today. So if you use Stellarium, yeah, uh, 23.3. It's just got a couple updates to it. So I've, I've got an account on a fairly new social media platform called Blue Sky. And uh, an enormous number of astronomers, astro artists, planetary scientists, and the like, including exoplanet researchers, have moved over there from the social media platform, formerly known as Twitter. And uh, I have a couple invite codes if anybody's interested. So, uh, let's see, special interest group. Do we have David Levy? David Levy is not here. All right. So, any astronomy questions or observing reports? Any of the, I saw the moon. My daughter, my daughter, my granddaughter saw the moon. Was all thrilled about it the other day. She also saw Venus in the morning sky. Saturn for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> Marty said he saw Saturn for five hours. All right. Uh, so it is seven twenty-two. We are very we are very short here. Uh, well, uh, Mark, Mike, ready to give your presentation? We can go early. It'll give us extra time to explore the uh, uh, Galileo exhibit here at Cranbrook. If you're not at Cranbrook, you can still make it. The Galileo exhibit here is open for us. So I am going to get him set up here. Mute and there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe I've got an echo here. Echo. We're working on it. Is there still an echo? Okay. Um, before I introduce Mike O'Dowd, I think it might be helpful if I say that four of the current officers are willing to run for an office for next year. 
you're welcome to run against any of the four of us. Uh, but we have four, uh, three offices for which we have no nominees at this point. Secretary, Publications, and Treasurer. And um, as far as publications, that, that basically means producing the WASP each month. And Dale Timi, our current publications director, is willing to continue editing the WASP, even though he won't be the publications chairman next year. So it's sort of not a very hard job. So anyhow, if, if anyone's interested, we especially need nominees for secretary publications and treasurer. See any board member tonight if you're interested. Um, so Mike O'Dowd, known him for a lot of years, been a member of the club for a long time. Uh, joined in uh, the Warren Astronomical Society in 1988. Um, he's had a lifelong interest in science and astronomy. Yay, Mike, I can identify with that. He uh, has previously served as both treasurer and observatory chairman uh, back in the 1990s. He's currently, he and Laura Wade are bringing our snacks to each meeting, which we greatly appreciate. Um, uh, Mike works as an automotive designer. Some of his hobbies include stargazing, of course, uh, computer flight simming, which I assume means some kind of simulation. Maybe you can clarify that a little when you get up here. Uh, building and collecting scale model rockets and spacecraft, and sometimes flying drones. Mike, let's hear it. Um, um, Mars Campbell Return, what is that? It's a uh, joint mission between NASA, uh, a joint uh, mission between uh, a joint project between NASA and the European Space Agency. And uh, can we start it and then pause it? Is it going to fill up the whole screen again? It might be down here. Before. The power point? No, this one. That's the zoom. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so we got to share that. Um, again, that's a joint mission between uh, NASA and the European Space Agency, Thomas. And uh, the idea is to bring back samples from Mars to Earth about 10 years from now. And how did I discover this? How did I find this? Dumb one. I'm kind of a YouTuber, YouTuber and watch YouTube videos. I just came across this by chance. And uh, the video, is uh, I find so inspiring. So, you know, it's, it's something what we can do when people work together and they put their minds to it. So this is just, can you have the lights, please? Um, this is, uh, this inspired me so much that it inspired me to give this talk. Why do you turn these lights down? Lights, please, and I'll, I'll start this. I don't see any. No, I'm just thinking. Come on, yeah, it's stage center. I don't think it's pretty. Watch this. Get that one here. Stopping the share. Earth is um, the plan is to have uh, samples from Mars. Uh, 
There we go. What is it? Back to Zoom. Share. Share media player. And. Get that in there, full screen. All right. Starting with beginning with sound. There we go. Get really good at lobbing into the air. Yes. This is amazing. Okay, PowerPoint is up. I show from the beginning. That's what's the thing with the media player out here. Is it, is it up there? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Um, my side of the Hold on, I gotta share that one to, to Zoom. Screen. This one we went. Not the presenter view. Okay. I'm looking at my sample return. So, um, oh, this is only not working. I'll do it manually. I can take that in there. Uh, the idea of the. Uh, sorry about this, folks. Um, the, the landers and the spacecrafts, uh, the spacecraft and landers. Oh, that's not auto. There we go. Sorry about this. That's for sign using this computer on the stage. Learning for priority. Uh, spacecraft and landers plan is to launch these around 2027, 2028, arrival at Mars, 2029, 2030. And return to Earth around 2031, 2032. Uh, this, the, the ideal of sending material back from Mars actually, actually started with the Perseverance rover. Uh, that landed, that touched down in 2021. And its primary mission is to is astrobiology, looking for signs of ancient life on Mars. And where uh, Perseverance landed was the Jericho Crater. Uh, it's actually in the Isidus Basin. Uh, there's several large basins on, on Mars. Uh, the, these basins are actually giant impacts themselves. This one's 930 miles across. It's not the largest one. And I think these basins are uh, kind of the, the tail end formation of the planets in Mars. And you have an idea how big this thing is. 
Michigan can easily fit inside this space, and it's not the largest one. And Jezero Crater is on the edge of this base, and this crater is 28 miles across itself, and so it's a fairly large crater. And for comparison, you can easily fit Detroit in the lower half of it. And uh, sorry, David Levy and others that may be out of state. I'm, this, I'm giving this presentation in Metro Detroit, so I'm going to be biased toward Detroit and Michigan. Now, if you look at the entire position, you'll see a delta. A delta, an ancient river flowed into this crater and it deposited this delta. And what is a delta? Well, this is Nora Lee. And the, the, this is the Mississippi. Uh, entering and, and dumping its water into the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, when a river's, the rivers cut into the landscape and pick up soil and dirt and rock and they deposit it downstream and, and it runs into a, a lake or an ocean, it will create a delta as it deposits that silver sand. And this is uh, perseverance recently at the delta, it landed in the crater and then it drove over to the delta. You can see the layers of what used to be mud and at the, uh, uh, on the arm of perseverance is a drill. Now this drill can drill into rock, solid rock. And what it does is it uh, drills into rock and picks up samples and it fills them into these uh, sample tubes. Um, and these sample tubes are then taken by the arm and put in the underbelly of the perseverance rover. And so there's like 40 here. Now there's a bit potential problem here in that what if uh, perseverance breaks down? But it's stuck in the sand. I mean, how do you then turn these there? So the plan is to have something like half of these samples on the rover, and the other half just dumped on the on the surface of the Mars, on the surface of Mars, so that some other vehicle, perhaps in the future, can pick them up. And this gives you an idea of the size of this vehicle. It's about the size of a good size SUV. And then uh 29, 20, 30 would be uh, the sample return lander. This will be the largest vehicle ever to land on Mars. Uh, Mass-wise, it's about twice the size of Perseverance. Um, 3.7 tons, that's US tons. And in that is going to be the orbital sample container. It will have, it can have 30 of these samples, and it will be bringing back between one and one and a half pounds of Martian material. Now, hi, problem. What if the uh, breaks down, it's stuck in the sand dune or something, and now what? Uh, the original plan was for uh, the European Space Agency to have a dedicated rover that does nothing but just pick up these samples. Um, they canceled that. They decided there were weight issues, cost issues, so they did this plan. What they're going to do is bring two helicopters, two helicopters with little retrieval arms. This is a backup plan. If something goes wrong with the rover, these little helicopters will land nearby. They, these have wheels on them. They'll move over, pick up the sample, and one by one, bring them back to the lander. And then the lander will reach down, pick up the samples, and put it into its rocket. And uh, this helicopter is based on uh, the Ingenuity helicopter there now that actually works very well. And in order to work in the atmosphere of Mars, you need ginormous propellers. And these are four foot long propellers. And it's been at uh, over a couple thousand RPM a set, uh, minute. And uh, to give you an idea of how thin the Martian atmosphere is, the surface atmosphere on Mars would be equivalent to going 100,000 feet up on the atmosphere. On board the Mars lander is a rocket. Mars has a vehicle. And in the nose cone of that rocket will be where the samples are. It's a two-stage rocket, solid rocket fuel. Uh, the first stage is gimbal controlled engine, and the second stage is spin stabilized, and in the nose cone will be our samples. Are they giving us an idea? Two feet tall, 990 pounds. It gives you an idea of the size, because even though this is remote robotic, it's still and it's 990. The rocket, not the woman in the picture, but the rocket. You know, some people are uh, sensitive about their weight. They think they weigh too much. We'll give you weight, Mars. Mars weight is 38%. Your, Mars gravity is 38% of its gravity. Uh, this rock, rocket needs to get up to 9,000 miles an hour. 
make margin already. It will take about 10 minutes to get there. Waiting in orbit above Mars will be the Earth return orbiter. This is going to be built by Airbus for the European Space Agency. This is a kind of two-part spacecraft. There's a, a, a suction that will fire up its motor to slow down to be captured by the enter Martian orbit. And then it will leave Martian orbit when the time comes using an ionic engine. This is a large vehicle. This, this will be the largest spacecraft ever by Martian orbit up to this point. You can see on the lower right compared to some other, like to, for example, the Mars reconnaissance orbit. 125 feet across, seven and a half tons. And then the uh, the samples are going to be put in this uh, nose cone shaped uh, reentry vehicle that will make it to Earth. It's going to take about two years. An ion engine will propel this toward Earth, and uh, then will be and the uh, the entry vehicle will be released. And this thing is going to slam in the air at about twenty five thousand miles an hour. That's the entry speed. When you come from outer space and come into Earth, the astronauts, when they came back from Apollo, were coming in at this speed. But uh, the way this thing is weighted and shaped, the air itself, the atmosphere drag itself, will slow this thing down, this thing down to 100 miles an hour. And guess what? They decided no parachute. They bother with a parachute. So crash in the desert. They're making it robust enough. To, and you bring back rock. So some of the people are right here. So. And uh, this gives you an idea of the size of the four feet across. And then they, they want they don't want to risk contaminating the samples with anything Earth or Martian bugs, germs contaminating us. So there's going to be like this quarantine procedure where these things are uh, taken and, and looked at. And uh, what are they going to do with these samples? What are some of the things you're going to be doing with these samples? Well, one of the things that I find frustrating and many others is that there could be fossils right in the rocks, right next to these rovers. They could be bacteria and be fossilized. We have bacterial fossils here on Earth, and there could be bacteria that lived in the past on Mars embedded in these rocks, and we have no way of knowing. Right at the foot of the land, there could be bacterial microfossils. So one of the things we're going to do, what you do on on Earth is you slice a rock into these really thin wafers, super thin wafers, polish both sides, and you shine a light through it and put it under a microscope. And these are, these are here's an example of micro, some microfossils. Uh, here's one estimated to be three and a half billion years old. This is uh, from Australia, cyanobacteria. And this is estimated to be three and a half billion years old, which is the same age as that. Delta on Mars, or at least what they think it is. So there's this bacteria on Earth. Could there have been bacteria on Mars at the same time? And it was it appears to be wet. Mars has a dry atmosphere and liquid water. Uh, right now, so we, as we talk, there's uh, testing going on for these vehicles and components. This is a scaled down version of a lander that they're working on. Uh, they're throwing up. Testing the system of throwing this rocket up. This rocket will be thrown 18 feet in the air, and the rocket will ignite. And the reason for throwing this thing up is they're worried that if they take off from the launch pad on Mars, the exhaust will damage the rocket. The exhaust can damage the vehicle, and, and flying debris can damage the rocket. So you launch it up in the air, and then light the engine. Uh, second stage engine engine test. Again, this is a solid rocket, uh, solid rocket motor. They're doing drop tests at 1,200 feet. They drop this thing and it gets up to about 100 miles an hour. We'll go 100 miles an hour, no faster, because they have that sort of drag. Okay, you ready for sticker shot? $9 billion. Um, looking at this, how much would it cost to send people to Mars and back? This is for one to one and a half pounds, it's going to cost $9 billion. So scale this up to people. And I was thinking of doing the math. I'm sorry, I'm hurting, so I stop. Um, I'm thinking hundreds of billion to send people to, to Mars and back. Uh, comparison, uh, rover sent to Mars was cost $5.2 billion. 
The James Webb Telescope, which went way over budget, ended up costing seven billion dollars. So this project is going to be the most expensive uh, unmanned mission by anyone. So what what's the biggest hurdle? Is it a technical? Congress. They're listening. Goodbye, Congress. So uh, here you go. Oh, return. Any questions? Yes, right here. I'm not sure I understand the question. How far apart? How far apart? Standard speed that yeah. They will they will deposit them in one or two groups right in scatter. Wow. And then the lander that comes down will land directly on the surface and they're gonna try to land it as close as they can to the first place. So and helicopters have range then to pick up the samples if they have to. The backup plan with the helicopters. They want to get this the lander as close as possible to the proofs of Earth. But it's not that far because the Earth has It's going farther every day. But it can move on. I'm, I'm not sure what he's, exactly what he's saying. Can you have a question? All right. Thank you for your time. Let's get some uh, lights back here. All right. Here. All right, back to Zoom. All right, so it is time for our break. It is 7.46, so... Why don't we meet at a quarter after eight? It'll give us a half an hour, and that'll, that'll give us plenty of time for the people here at Cranbrook to tour the Galileo exhibit, which is open. So and we're going to adjourn for a half hour, and we'll do our uh, we'll do my presentation then. So see you in a half hour. So my thing back here.
I'm almost ready here. I just want to make sure this is up and running right. So we have to look at that. That's the I will not be sitting. When we were emptying out the shell, that night, but her Gemini hunts air is not going to go out and go out and go in and stop. Right? No. Right? And then we, uh, but you're right. Why don't you get to know that? Yeah, just as long as you're not. I don't know. There's one I got a picture of. They're going to be able to know everything out of the cell. They're just kind of calm around. They're just kind of calm around. We ain't ever even trying to do it. We're all just kind of trying to do it. Friday, he was supposed to be here. Friday, 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 Mike Narlock, I can I can I can forward the stuff to you. I got I got to contact him and say hey say who's coming. Panel, I'm glad you brought that. Up. You need to take a freaking photograph. It's something not a bunch of dots on the computer. That's a computer monitor. Who cares? That is not going to get into the drama. You have not not that little photo. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. Your nice little NASA thing you built. You got people going in. Take a picture of that. You're not getting these dots in the gallery. It's not dots. You know, for example, you have. Yeah. I can see you going. Yeah. Not at all. They have a five dollar battery. I think they have a bucket. Oh, no, we got it. Uh, 
Oh, we got that. Oh, okay. Okay, three or four. Yeah, yeah. There's one. I mean, that's just the first step. Or, I don't know. Or, she could pay for the bank. I wonder if I get the reason. Margie would give me two tens for a 20. So you got two tens for a 20 in there? Uh, one of them. I have uh, about two twenty for a 10. <laughs> Jeffrey, yeah, okay. yeah. 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 it really does. Ryan Teeny has had the drawings in there. Ryan Teeny has done drawings. Yeah. Nice, yeah. smart, smart, smart. Yeah. You're telling me that galaxy is not a beautiful? It's not. I'm just telling you the truth. It matters. It's your opinion. That's right. And since I'm in charge of picking the pictures, it's my opinion. Okay. If you, want, if you want to take over, you can yeah, bring I'll your, the next so here we go. You can put your dots in there. Yeah. 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 And so, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Any, okay. Exactly what actual photos are. Or dots. Probably not. All right. You have a change. Uh, I need to donate five bucks for this letter. Thirty-five. Do I actually find the calendar? Yeah. So yeah. So if I donate, I'll take it. Maybe I'll take it. Oh, you, you did it now. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's better. You got everybody's picture. All right, I think this is the way we do it from now on. Two monitors. <laughs> present your, monitor present I'll do it. Presenter view and zoom on here and presentation on the screen so everybody sees it here and that's what's being shared, but I still got my presenter view. That is one thing for ticket. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I would love to have a photo of your thing that you built with a few people looking at it. Then we're out of public outline. I would love to put that in the yeah. thing that you built. Yeah, really cool. Yeah. Okay. And people looking at it and doing this one. That'd be great. Take a picture of that thing. Yeah. We need to see your name. And I love my gal. You put a lot of work into that coat. And it's also based on the actual sign. Like that is a real simulator. Yeah, oh, of a spiral galaxy. Well, we yeah. did need the photograph to watch the TV. Okay. Right. That's comprised of me and Bob Well, we need a non answer photographer on the committee. I'll donate $5 if I get a calendar. Uh, that's what I meant. Okay. Am I all set? Uh, yes. What is that? So, Jeff, how do you do that for next year? I mean, what is my question here? I would love to see a nice picture of your. What are you talking about? John, I'm going to get a picture. Part of the photo for this one. Yeah, I can't see all of it. So, don't you have a guy or something? There you go. How cool is that? I don't know. Real people. They're not going to know what it is. It's going to look like a truck on a trail. Oh, I don't know. 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 Oh, you simulated a lot of operations, but it's not in the speed of the speed of the the speed of the the speed of the that's the dot check. Can you see the ball the ball just under the light? That's the net. Wow. Okay. Okay. Wow. 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 Wow.
So you should have another one that uh from earlier today that has the guy spraying it from you? No, it's from uh, from Mark. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Why are mentioning that they can't get through the division can still breathe? Okay, then it's gonna pass when it's okay. Yeah, it's your stuff that they can't drive. They can't smoke in the jet or it's easy to get some air. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's all about. Yeah, 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 it's all about. binoculars in and see what comes up. Then I'd search the web. Then I'd ask you guys. <laughs> So, uh, this is this guy who works at the Vatican Observatory. Um, he 
is a retired college professor and he uh, taught himself Latin so that he could translate texts from the Vatican Observatory Museum of Galileo conversing with other astronomers at the time. So he's not only you know looking at Galileo, he's looking at how Galileo is talking to other people in Latin. So that's crazy, but he uh I did a podcast with him um, at the at the VO, and uh, we we're talking about Galileo and how many of his students were asking him about Galileo and all of them had their concepts of what he was and what was going on with the church and him completely wrong. And so he brings that up, and he also brings up how he's looked at texts for middle school and colleges talking about Galileo and how many of them get it wrong. How many calendars? Big Five minute warning. Five minute warning.
Minute warning. All right, so we're going to get this show on the road in just a second here. People are taking the seats here at Cranbrook. Going for our future presentation. Would you be by me? So, Dale, ready to go? Yeah. Where are you? I'm ready. Okay, we're ready to get started again. <clears throat> so our president, Bob Trombley, is our uh, main speaker tonight. Um, he is not only the president of the Warren Astronomical Society uh, and running for next year. Yes. Um, although I understand he would welcome competitors. Uh, as we all would. <laughs> uh, he's also a volunteer NASA Jet Propulsion Labs Solar System Ambassador, a podcast host for the Vatican Observatory Foundation, and he's on the board of the Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs, which just successfully hosted the latest Astronomy yeah. at the Beach event. Uh, his topic tonight is of interest to all of us, it's on exoplanets. Take it away, Bob. Thank you, Dale. Great, so let me have my uh, second screen up here so I can actually do this right. Alrighty, so, uh, yeah. Um, doink. Alrighty, okay. So I am Bob Tremblay. I am a volunteer, NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. This is a really cool program that NASA has, and they look for people that do a lot of outreach, and uh, they recruit you. And uh, uh, I've been I've been one since 2013, and it, it's really cool. You get swag from them, and you get to uh, talk to mission specialists, engineers, and scientists. It's a really cool program. Um, I am president of this society through no fault of my own. Um, I am uh, the web guy for the Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs. I, I handle their website, and uh, as Dale said, uh, they are going to need some new uh, board members themselves come January. And I am a factotum. That is a great word for the Vatican Observatory Foundation. That's somebody who does a lot of different things. I, I, I do their podcast, their newsletter. I post website articles. I post uh, uh, research papers. It's, it's just crazy what I do for them. So, but. So yes, the Vatican was, uh, does have a telescope. Actually, they have several. Um, and that is my boss, Brother Guy Consolmagno. If you, he makes me laugh every time I talk with him, and it's a great thing for a boss to do. So he is the Pope's astronomer, and so I love dropping his name because, you know, I can. But uh, I am a podcast host for these guys, and I'm working on Adrian's podcast right now. It's actually going to be an enhanced podcast with a whole bunch of his uh, 
images included with it. So I am working on that right now. So before I talk about exoplanets, let me introduce you to my mother-in-law. This is uh, Judith Martin and my baby granddaughter from several years ago. My mother-in-law is a voracious consumer of uh, Nova and how the other universe works. I am constantly seeing, I, I come up and fill my coffee up and she's watching one of these things and I get sucked into it for 20 minutes. But so she watches astronomy programs like crazy, absolutely loves it. No formal education in it at all. And I asked her, Ma, you know what a pulsar is? She says, uh, I think I've heard that word. And I said, okay, then it's time. I need review slides for this because I presented this to the Detroit Public Library. So if I had to assume if my mother-in-law who consumes astronomy like crazy can't tell me what a pulsar is, the general public probably isn't either. So our sun dwells in a vast sea of stars. There's just stars everywhere. And these star forming regions are vast clouds of gas and dust that are spread throughout our galaxy. They condense due to gravity, solar wind, supernova shock waves, and they form stars. Again, these are star forming regions. Our sun uh, and its planets condensed out of one of these clouds. This is actually a picture from my youth from National Geographic. I just love this shot. Um, we're currently <clears throat> about halfway through our sun's 10 billion year, year lifespan. And our, uh, when we get to the, re well, yes? You're not coming through to YouTube. I'm not coming through to YouTube. Uh, oh my God. Well, wait one moment, please. Testing, testing, testing. Oh, there we go. All right, there we go. I probably have to mute this thing now, but it's going to be coming through here. All right. All right, so we, we should be good now. On YouTube. All right, so our sun and its planets condensed out of that cloud, and it's currently about halfway through its lifespan. As I said, we are we are there. Um, at the end of our sun's life, uh, what's going to remain is a hot, dense, bright white dwarf star. And uh, well, I got to be sure if I ever show this to kids, I got to make sure you know, don't go home and tell your parents that the sun's going to die. And you're not going to have to worry about that. It's a long time from now. So white dwarfs have a mass comparable to our sun packed into about a sphere about the size of the Earth. Uh, they're no longer undergoing fusion. They're very dense. And the little guy on the right here is the smallest white dwarf known. It's very dense, likely the result of a collision of two white dwarfs that didn't explode into a type, A1, uh, type 1A supernova. So white dwarfs are small, hot. Our sun is a G-class star. Um, class K and M stars are considered red dwarfs, and they are so dim, they are invisible to the naked eye. The first red dwarf was discovered using a telescope in 1753. The red dwarfs are by far the most populous type of star in the sky. I, I like this quote. This is one of my, from my, one of my favorite science fiction authors. Our sun is bigger than 80% of stars. Now, that being said... There are stars a lot bigger than our sun, but the percentages starts to go way down as you get bigger. So these, this image shows the relative sizes of main sequence stars and the really big O type stars fused through their fuel in about 10 million years, relatively short time span. And these are the stars that can go boom in supernova explosions and the core can collapse into a black hole, which we're not going to be talking about because that's a whole lecture of its own, or a neutron star. So a uh, neutron star, look, notice how the neutron star is affecting the gravity. Whoops, around, around that is bending the light that's coming around it. So um, 
A pulsar is a type of neutron star. It's a rotating neutri neutron star, highly magnetized, and it emits these beams of electromagnetic energy that if they're aimed at us like a lighthouse, we, we can see them. And they're, they're very, very regular. Now, the Crab Nebula, which you're probably familiar with, it has a pulsar in it. And as a matter of fact, uh, it was discovered in 1968. It's among the first pulsars discovered and is the fastest and most energetic pulsar uh, formed from a supernova explosion. It has a rotational speed of 33 milliseconds. And the time-lapse movie you're seeing here is from a series of 10 Hubble exposures. It reveals the wave-like rings expanding out from the pulsar. And that's just, that's just crazy. So here's a view of the crab pulsar from way, way too close. You don't want to get this close and you don't want, you definitely don't want to be in the path of that stream. So I'm pretty sure most of you have seen the sun's spectrum through a prism or a crystal at some point in your life. Well, if you take that sun spectrum and spread it way out, you get to see all these black lines. And keeping explanations short, these are uh, fingerprints of the elements that make up the sun. And so when you're looking at a light from a star, you can tell what that star is made of. And that is just a mind-blowing concept and very useful. So gravitational lensing is when the gravity of a massive object or massive objects bends the light from a more distant object. And you saw that in the previous slides from Pulsar and the Neutron Star. This is from uh, this is an actual image from James Webb's first deep field of a huge galaxy cluster. Uh, you can see the smeared and stretched orange galaxy. That's all the same galaxy. It's being stretched and, uh, and, and duplicated as it passes through this galaxy cluster. So um, what is a planet? Well, this video from CGP Gray does a really good job uh, of describing what planets are. And the de definition of a planet has changed over the centuries. I mean, way back when, it if it's bright and moved across the sky, that was a planet. Well, the moon and the sun are obviously not planets. So we need to come up with a definition. So in even the number of planets, has changed over the years, and the definition of those have changed over the years. So the International Astronomical Union says a planet is in orbit of the sun, has sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium, it's round, and has cleared its neighborhood. Now that, that, that last point there is kind of contentious sometimes because there's a whole lot of stuff in the Earth's orbit, nothing Earth-sized or even Moon-sized, but there are a lot of asteroids in Earth's orbit. So has it cleared its orbit? Well, of large bodies, yeah. Small bodies, not so much. So, okay, enough with the review. So, uh, Albertus Magnus asked way back when, you know, do many, do many worlds exist? Uh, this, this fellow uh, became St. Albert the Great. He was uh, a philosopher, scientist, and a bishop. And he, he one of those guys that just did it all way back when. But he asked the question, you know, are there more than one world? So the concept has been around for a while. Cosmic pluralism described, describes numerous worlds. I love this picture. I found this picture. Um, it, it shows a representation of all the exoplanets we found. And that, that's like a small sliver of it you're looking at there. So the idea has been around since ancient times. And only more recently has it come in to mainstream culture. So I'm pretty sure that these guys had something to do with keeping it in the mainstream culture. I mean, Flash Gordon, the Earth is threatened by a collision with rogue planet Mongo, and Superman came from the asteroid debris field formerly known as the planet Krypton. So, so there are any number of, of recent popular science fiction and fantasy programs that take place on other worlds and how you get there is fantastic or takes ridiculous amounts of energy. So in 1992, uh, the first exoplanet was discovered. Uh, it was uh, discovered orbiting a pulsar, which is why I had to ask if my mom knew what a pulsar was. So uh, in 1994, a third planet was uh, discovered in this same system uh, around a pulsar, and it was named Draugr. And uh, this is a, this is a, an image from the surface of Draugr in space engine. 
Draugr are also these creepy undead monster in the Viking exploration survival game Valheim, which I play. So in 1995, while there was much debate over exoplanet discovery, which one was considered the first, this one stands out and uh, it got its own NASA travel poster. Uh, when they discovered 51 uh, Pegasi B, it forever changed the way we see the universe and our place in it. The exoplanet is about half the mass of Jupiter, and uh, it orbits very, very close to its star. This is the comparison of that system with our sun. The star 51 Pegasus orbit, orbits is pretty much like our sun. So as you can see, it orbits way inside the orbit of Mercury. So it's taking only 4.2 days to orbit its sun-like star, which means it's it was classified as a hot Jupiter. Its atmosphere is likely being blown off in a comet tail because it's so close to its star. Uh, this graphic shows how we thought all planetary systems would look before we discovered 51 Pegasi b. A uh, rocky terrestrial planet near the star, gaseous uh, planet further out. And, well, no, that was not our work because we found a gas giant really close. And how'd that happen? Um, I, I like how you look, look on Google and stuff. They say things like, ushered in a whole new class of planets and marked a turning point. My recollection was is, is, is it threw a monkey wrench into uh, our, our hypotheses of, of planetary formation. So 51 Pegasi B was unofficially dubbed Bellerophon by astronomer uh, Jeffrey Marcy, following the convention of naming planets after Greek or Roman mythological figures. Bellerophon was a figure from Greek mythology who rode a winged horse Pegasus. Bellerophon is also the name of the starship from the fantastic science fiction movie Forbidden Planet in 1956, starring Walter Pidgeon and Francis and Leslie Nielsen. If you've not seen it, you should see it because it's a fantastic movie. So the IAU ran a naming contest for 51 Pegasi B. Uh, in December of 2015, they announced the winning name was Dimidium, Dim Idiom, not Latin for half referring to the planet's mass of approximately half that of Jupiter. So uh, they uh, uh, took the spectra of that exoplanet and they discovered water in its atmosphere. And I have a list uh, of, of the uh, uh, paper for that. Uh, and in 2019, uh, the discoverers of this exoplanet won a Nobel Prize in physics. <clears throat> Thank you. So what are they? Uh, we have an actual planet orbiting a main sequence star. We need to define that a little bit more for the textbooks now. So uh, they have to be objects with masses below 13 Jupiter masses, which is you know the limiting uh, mass for thermonuclear uh, fusion of deuterium. So this image here, I created in Universe Sandbox, and I went plop Jupiter there, plop Jupiter next to it, increased its mass to 12.9 Jupiters, and did that. Okay, so I create this slide, and then I'm like, well, why? what happens if you do 13? Well, you do 13, it starts to fuse. I increased it to 13 Jupiters, and lo and behold, it starts getting real hot. So that was, that was pretty fun. So, uh, it has to have sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium. It has to be round, just, just like just like a regular planet. And it also has to have cleared its neighborhood like a regular planet. But here's the actual IAU definition. But when you start talking about L4, L5 instabilities and somehow figuring the square root of 621 in there, my eyes start to glass over. But yeah, so... What are they? They're a planet-like body outside the solar system. It's short for extrasolar planet. And the first time that, uh, that Google found that term used was uh, 1992 when they discovered that first exoplanet. Now, my wife uh, taught middle school uh, science uh, for years, and this was her latest textbook from 2005. And I looked through it, and it did not have any mention of the exoplanet at all. Now, remember, 1992, so they, they were around for a while. Now, 
I, I looked that the company that made that textbook went belly up and this is the replacement for it. It does have a chapter on exoplanets and uh, Dale Parton told me that uh, his new astronomy book also has a chapter on exoplanets. I would actually like to see what it has to say about them. So they can be orbiting a single star or a multiple star in a multiple star system. Um, they can be unbound to a star, free-floating rogue planets like Mongo. Um, this is an image from the uh, European Space Agency showing an artist's impression of a rogue planet that's actually been discovered. Uh, it's showing you a uh, visible light on the left, and you can see it glowing kind of reddish, and uh, infrared light on the right, and it's very bright in infrared, and that is how they discovered it. So this is this is uh, any one of these rogue planets I go to in the app Space Engine, and I even went into a globular cluster with a lot of uh, stars around to try and light it up. They are black as coal, and you can't see anything. Now, uh, the funny thing about that is NASA has a, one of those travel posters for another one of these planets. And here, where the nightlife never ends, and that is very true. Um, so how, how would you guys, would you guys be okay with uh, a planet, being on a planet with eternal nighttime and no moon? Yeah, I mean, that would, really, you probably have to have some mental fortitude to be at that on that planet. So several, Thousand is the number of exoplanets we've found so far. Uh, this image is from the interactive NASA Eyes on Exoplanets, which if I have time, I'll be showing you. You can click on any one of these stars and get info uh, and a hypothetical representation of the exoplanet associated with them. And this is fully interactive. It works on a browser, so it works on your well, PC, Mac, Linux, phone, tablet. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so here is the current count. This is today's count, 5523. And I, I kept the last couple from the months down. So this number goes up practically every other week. And uh, so it's if it's not increasing daily now, uh, it will be in the near future. Um, this shows the exoplanet discovery rate since 1972. And you can see about, what, 2015 starts going crazy. And this shows the... Uh, the ways that these things were discovered. So the transit, the green bar there, is by far uh, the, the the most the most exoplanets have been discovered using that method. And radial velocity, you'll see on the red thing on the bottom, it's just been slowly increasing. Um, but so transits when a planet crosses in front of its parent star's disk, it will cause uh, the brightness to dip just a little bit. And the amount depends on the star, the size of the planet, yada, yada. But the fact that we can detect this at all is crazy. And amateurs are starting to detect this kind of stuff too. So that that's just amazing. Um, because this method requires that the planet's uh, orbit intersect the line of sight with Earth, um, that you know, that orbital plane has to be dead on to us. If it's, oops, I did not mean to do that. Center. So uh, that orbital plane has to be dead on to us. If, it, if it's angled up, it'll, it'll miss us and uh, will have to be detected with other methods, which I'll be talking about. So the Kepler Space Telescope, I'll be talking about this uh, more in, in, in a later slide. Uh, it used the transit method uh, to discover a whole bunch, and, and they're still uh, confirming candidates from this data set. Transit timing variations. Uh, if you have multiple planets, each one can slightly perturb the other's orbit and sm small variations in the times of a transit for one planet can indicate the presence of another planet that may not transit, which was the case for uh, uh, Kepler-19. Kepler-19 Variations in the transits of Kepler-19b suggested the existence of another non-transiting planet, Kepler-19c, which was later found using the radial velocity method. Transit duration var uh, variation. When a planet orbits multiple stars or the planet has moons, it can vary uh, the transit uh, time slightly or significantly. Although no new planets or moons have been discovered with this method, it's 
uh, successfully confirmed many transiting circumbinary planets. I got several examples of that. If a transiting planet is on an eccentric orbit, the duration of the transit is sensitive to the orientation of the orbital ellipse. Now, this is kind of, this is crazy. You could start having a, uh, a relativity effects. The <clears throat> because the periapsis, the close part of the orbit, is so close to the star, it can actually cause the orbit to precess around the star. So if it's transiting for some months, it might not be transiting uh, for quite some time after that because the orbit, the, the transit is precessed out of our field of view. So yikes. Um, there, here, here it shows the, uh, the orbit, the orbit precessing around that star. So uh, radial velocity, this is the second most common method. If a planet, when a planet orbits a star, that star also moves in a small orbit around the system's center of mass or the barycenter. Variations in the star's radial velocity, that is the speed with which it moves away or towards the Earth can be detected by displacements in that star's spectral line uh, due to the Doppler effect. Radial velocity variations of one meter per, sec per second or somewhat less can be observed. So they can detect a star wobbling a meter per second light years away. That's, it's crazy. It's mad science. <laughs> gravitational microlensing. I showed you the, the uh, gravitational lensing of a galaxy. But stars can cause uh, microlensing uh, uh, effects themselves. And if there is a planet orbiting that star, it can cause shifts in that lensing. And uh, this, this type of method is most sensitive to detecting planets about 1 to 10 AU away from the star. So close, fairly close. So direct imaging. Well, stars are bright. And planets are extremely faint, like a billion times uh, less faint than a star they're orbiting. So that can make, you've got, you got to block out the parent's glare. And that is what you do with direct imaging from telescopes. It's necessary to block that light to reduce the glare while leaving the light from the planet detectable. Doing so is a major technological challenge and requires extreme optothermal stability, whatever that is. But all exoplanets that have been directly imaged are both large, more massive than Jupiter, and widely separated from their star. And here's an example. You're seeing this over the course of several years. Planets orbiting a star there. So that previous image was taken by the Keck Observatory. These are on Mauna Kea, I believe in Hawaii. Uh, Keck uses laser guide star adaptive optics. You've seen these uh, 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 telescopes blasting lasers. What's going on is it creates an artificial star in the atmosphere that can be used by software to soften atmospheric turbulence. So here's an example of, of what that looks like. So you can see why that would be good for looking for exoplanets. That, that's just amazing that that works at all. It works by exciting sodium atoms in the Earth's atmosphere and creating an artificial star. Again, mad science. So formal hot B was previously thought to be an exoplanet. It was reported so for a long time ago, but over the course of time, they found out it was just an expanding cloud of dust. So one, one, one removed from our list. Now that image, Fumblehot was uh, imaged using the Hubble Space Telescope, which I'll be discussing later. Um, this guy uh, I saw on Twitter, or social media network, and uh, this guy is, you're seeing uh, spiral arms uh, coming off of these exoplanet forming. So they're, 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 they're getting amazing with what they're able to do with direct imaging. So that image was taken with the Large Binocular Telescope. And if I was standing looking at the bar, binar, Large Binocular Telescope, the Vatican's Advanced Technology Telescope would be like right over there, right next to it. <clears throat> some, other some other telescopes uh, doing exoplanet research are the Gemini North, 
It has the Gemini Planet Imager, a high contrast imaging instrument that allows for direct imaging and integral field spectroscopy of extrasolar planets around nearby stars and it has its own really cool logo. So uh, the Very Large Telescope is four 8.2 meter uh, movable uh, telescopes that can work together as a giant interferometer. VLT Sphere is an adapt adaptive optic system. That's that thing circled in red there. That's, that's in the Very Large Telescope. It provides direct imaging as well as spectroscopic and polarometric characterization of exoplanet systems. So uh, that someone's Star Trek techno babble is uh, very strong there. So the Subaru telescope, it has, uh, it's also a stream adaptive optics instrument, high contrast imaging system for direct imaging of exoplanets. So this one was, this, 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 uh, this image was taken over, what, 17 year time lapse. And what's interesting, you can see the star's light being blocked out. Now this thing starts at 2006. And when it gets back to the beginning here, watch how big the, the block of the star is. It's huge. And then about 2010, it halves in size. So they got their software better for uh, blocking out the, the light of that star. So that's a 17 year time lapse of a planet orbiting its star. So that is Beta Pictoris B. It, it is 12 times the mass of Jupiter as a 23 or 23 year orbit, kind of like Saturn ish. And so, how many exoplanets could there be? Well, um, this this post shows that after they after they started finding them, they, 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 the estimate is there's at least one planet for every star in the Milky Way. And Milky Way has 100 to 400 billion stars. So, and the number of rogue planets discovered so far is only 30. Half of those are candidates, but the estimates for the number of rogue planets is nearly two Jupiter mass rogue planets for every star. And one study says 100,000 times that number. So how many? <laughs> A lot, billions at least. So. I, I'm pretty sure Carl Sagan would, would love what's been going on with exoplanet research recently. So another surprising trend emerged from the study. Uh, uh, this, this is kind of crazy. They're finding out, I'm not going to go through this huge explanation here, but <laughs> they, they found out that different areas of the Milky Way might be more suitable for uh, Saturn-type exoplanets as it is for Jupiter-type exoplanets. There's this giant description here that su suggests a truly close relationship during planet formation is between sub-Saturns and sub-Neptunes, not sub-Saturns and Jovians. And that is under the fun facts section of that article. So uh, that's a fun fact, yikes. So Andromeda has a trillion stars. So even if 1% of the stars in Andromeda had planets, that would be 10 billion planets. Yeah, Andromeda's huge. So story time. This is a really interesting story. The you know, world looks treasure, the first evidence of exoplanets. Way back in 1914, uh, Van Ma Manen, and I never get his name right, found what he called a very faint star. And he, he spotted it due to its proper motion, through motion, uh, compared to the other stars, and they named it after him. Okay, that's nice. A um, few years later, the spectrum of that star was taken on glass photographic plates, like they did up until like the 1980s. It was using Mount Wilson on Mount Wilson, and this fellow later became the uh, director of Mount Wilson. So they class because of because of the uh, spectra they took of that they classified Van Manen star as a class F, and slightly larger than our star, due to the calcium and iron and, and other elements, heavy elements they saw in there. Um, there was a conflict in articles uh, in whether it was Van Manen or that guy that named it. I saw one that said one, one that said the other. So who knows? But so they they classified it as a class F. 
1923, only a few years later, uh, uh, Leinen, who has several stars named after him, had Van Manen's star classified as one of the only three white dwarfs known. So its classification got changed in a few years. Fast forward to 2012, uh, Ben Zuckerman was uh, doing research for uh, a an, uh, presentation he was going to give at a, a convention about polluted white dwarfs. Yeah, right. Polluted what now? Okay, this uh, polluted white dwarfs, you know, white dwarf star, uh, stars at the end of their lives, about the size of the earth. Well, there's a class of white dwarfs that have these heavy elements, such as magnesium, iron, calcium, in their normally clean atmospheres. And these elements show up in the spectrum. And these must have come from bodies like planets or asteroids, which got torn apart by the planet's gravity or the white dwarf's gravity and burned up in their atmospheres. But planets and comets and asteroids don't just randomly change their orbit. It takes something to push or pull them. And the best candidates for that are planets orbiting that white dwarf. So the idea is that these planets perturb asteroids and, and other, other exoplanets and, and feed these white dwarfs. So Looking at it from the perspective of a 21st century astronomer, he knew exactly what he was looking at. So he was looking at the evidence that there might have he might have discovered evidence for the first exoplanet way back in 1914, 1917 time frame, but they didn't know what they were looking at. So today we know that Van Manen star is about 14 light years away, and it's the closest white dwarf to Earth that is not part of a binary system. And it eats asteroids or planets. So they found a uh, planet, they think they found a planet, an exoplanet, orbiting a star in another galaxy. Uh, in September 2020, they detected a candidate planet orbiting a high mass X ray binary star, which consists of a stellar remnant neutron star black hole and a massive star, likely a B supergiant. The planet would be slightly smaller than Saturn and an, or an orbital distance of some tens of AUs. And uh, it was uh, the first intergalactic candidate was published in Nature in 2021. So now they're finding them in other galaxies. So there are a lot of weird and interesting exoplanets out there. And this screen here is the featured planets menu from NASA's Eyes on Exoplanets app. You click on any one of these things and go right to a definition of the planet. It'll show you a comparison of that planet to Earth and uh, over the star and give you a definition uh, of, of what's going on with the planet and how long it can take to get there, which are all really huge numbers. And uh, things like this guy, uh, if, if it's a Jupiter mass planet, it'll show a comparison to Jupiter. Um, I, I love how it's like WASP-12 is doomed. This, this guy is over, it's so close to its planet star, it's egg-shaped, and the point closest to the star is probably glowing incandescently. So here's a close-up of Wasp and Space Engine. That this, this one was from NASA's Eyes uh, app. This is from Space Engine. Looks pretty much the same. Uh, you can see the egg shape and the atmosphere being blown off to the left in, in, the, in the blue. So there, there's a zoom out of it. It orbits really close to its star, and 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 like the, like fifty one Pegasi B, its atmosphere is probably getting blown off. So I, I love the folks. This is from NASA Eyes. I love the folks that wrote this description. Oh, uh, <laughs> Kepler seventy B could well be another circle of hell with an average temperature hotter than the sun's surface. It used to be a Jupiter-sized planet until it spent some time inside its now dead star, a trip that destroys most planets, but left this one a Freddy Krueger-like burned up world smaller than Earth. At about 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it is one of the hottest planets discovered. In fact, the planet is evaporating soon to be another victim. Somebody had fun writing that. <laughs> so this one is a terrestrial planet 
it orbits a B-type star, very hot. It, it, it masses at 0.44 Earths. It takes 0.2 days to orbit that star. So it's whipping around that star. And it was uh, announced in 2011. So here's, here's, that, here's that mosaic I was telling you about. This is from halcyonmaps.com. Um, and they, they split like eight sections off of this. But they, this is just an art, artist representation of all the different exoplanets. And we've got everything from the really hot Jupiters to the cold Jupiters to the, 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 the Neptunes and the Earth, Earth size or Earth mass planets. We haven't found an Earth yet. I suppose that's, that's, the, that's the holy grail. So there are several close-up images, like I mentioned. And... Uh, I noticed the rings on this one, and I said, what, does that one have rings? So I, I went to a definition now. It didn't have rings. Art, artistic license. But there are, there are. There is an exoplanet that likely has rings. Many of them likely do, but this one definitely does. Uh, it, exoplanet J1407b, that's the one that, okay, I got I to gotta do an aside here. <laughs> At astronomy at the beach, right? I, I'm, I'm I have talking about exoplanets, and this kid comes up to me. I'm, I'm talking about exoplanets. He says, "Can you go to J1047b?" I'm like, "Whoa!" And as I'm talking to this kid, I'm suddenly realizing he's weird. He made me look stupid. So it's good to see, but yikes! But anyway, he asked me to go to this planet in, in, in Space Engine, and here it is. It's showing, showing you the rings. Uh, the rings are probably made of dust because it's too, high, it's too hot and close to the star to support ice rings. It has 30 rings with a diameter of tens of millions of kilometers. So, you know, the planet is... So, the closest exoplanet orbits the closest star, Proxima Centauri b about four light years away. Its mass is consistent with being slightly larger than Earth. And based on what we know about exoplanets and planets in our solar system, similar to the mass of Earth, it's most likely a rocky planet. It orbits in Proxima Centauri b's habitable zone, which means it could have liquid water on the surface if it has an atmosphere to support it. So this is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this is a Proxima Centauri b from Space Engine. And it is likely a tidally locked. So you'll see uh, around the shadow there, uh, it starts to ice up. So the back end of the planet is going to be totally ice. And here's, here's hovering over that divide. You see ice on one side and, and, and rock on the other. <coughs> so yeah, this is just eye candy. I love what you can do this in space engine. So this is a this is a representation of what sunrise would look like on the on the closest exoplanet. So Proxima Centauri is a dim white dwarf star uh, that's compared to our sun. It gives off about six hundred times less light than our sun, but it's still nine thousand times further away than Neptune. Uh, red dwarfs <laughs> can. They can blast off some pretty massive solar flares. And uh, in 2019, Proxima Centauri, that very star we're talking about, emitted a mega flare that lasted only seven seconds, but it was 100 times more powerful than those emitted by the sun and in ultraviolet. So that's going to scrub any ecosystems on those planets. So get out your SPF 1 million for one of those events. So the Proxima Centauri system is crazy too. You've got planets orbiting in, in different paths close to the star and one much further out. So that, but that's that's the closest star to us. It's got three exoplanets that we know of so far. So can we go to an exoplanet? I'm gonna make this real simple. No, you cannot go there. So using our, Using our current level of technology, we can barely get past the moon. So, no, you're not going to any exoplanet. So, why would you want to? It would take hundreds of thousands of years. I did a whole presentation on that, and somebody else did a whole presentation on that, too, here. So, a lot of space telescopes are doing exoplanet research. You might be familiar with this one. Launched in 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope. 
is a large space-based observatory that revolutionized astronomy and also got panned in its first couple of years until they fixed it um, after the installation of its corrective optics. It is named after Edwin Hubble, who uh, pioneered the, uh, the idea that the universe is expanding and figured out that galaxies were actually masses of stars past our Milky Way. So this is one of NASA's great observatories. It's observed planets inside and outside our solar system. Uh, it studied uh, an exoplanet, the first exoplanet known to transit. Uh, it uh, studied the TRAPPIST-1 system, which was a very famous exoplanet system. I'll be talking about that later too. Um, more than 30 years after its launch, Hubble continues to investigate the atmospheres of transiting exoplanets and remains one of the most valuable and successful windows on the cosmos. And it's operating on its backup computer, which is scary. Hubble just celebrated its 30th anniversary. Oh, and there's talk between SpaceX and NASA about uh, doing a feasibility study to send a crew up there to possibly boost it and, and save it. Now, would that, they, if they're going to do that, I would think they would, they would have to replace some of the uh, you know, computer equipment and that kind of stuff, but it's still working. So the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched in 2003. Uh, it its mission was to become NASA's premier infrared observatory. It offered astronomers the ability to peer in the region of space that were hidden from optical telescopes. Uh, it too is one of NASA's great observatories. It observed the rings of Saturn, studied the furthest galaxies, and identified two of the most distant supermassive black holes ever discovered among its accomplishments in its 16-year mission. It was named after Lyman Spitzer, and he came up with the idea of space-based telescopes. So uh, one of the original goal of the Spitzer was uh, studying was not to study exoplanets, but with innovations during its mission uh, and updates to its software and stuff, it turned into a critical tool for exoplanet research. So there's the Trappist system. In 2017, the Spitzer helped reveal the Trappist system, the first known system of seven Earth-sized planets. Uh, discovery set a record for the greatest number of planets in the habitable zone found around a single star. And data from Spitzer show that all of these planets are likely to be rocky. So there's the Trappist-1 system. This is from the NASA Eyes on the Solar System. And it shows you several of those planets inside that star's habitable zone. But again, this is a red dwarf star. Most of these planets are likely tidally locked, which means one side faces that star all the time. So you're going to have a frozen back end. So this uh, travel poster from NASA depicts the Trappist-1 system uh, and, and the, red giant, the red dwarf star behind it. Uh, let's see, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is expected to continue exploration of this system. The TRAPPIST system is from 40 light years of, from Earth, and uh, NASA started releasing these uh, line drawing versions of these travel posters, so you can have your child color code them however they want. So I thought that was really cool, and they've got just absolute tons of these things. So Kepler, launched in 2019, was designed to survey a portion of Earth's region of the Milky Way to discover Earth-sized exoplanets in or near habitable zones and estimate how many uh, of the billions of stars in the Milky Way have such planets. So it is named after Johannes Kepler, who is best known for his laws of planetary motion. And he's another one of his guys who astronomer, mathematician, astrologer, national, national you know, music, he just did everything. I don't know how those guys had time to do all that stuff. <laughs> so the Kepler mission looked continuously at this area of the sky. It looked at over 100,000 stars in this region, and uh, the field is extremely large for astronomical telescopes. Most telescopes, like Hubble, only view a small region about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. This one covers about the size of a hand at arm's length, which is just absolutely huge. Now, since transits 
only uh, last a fraction of a day, all the stars must be monitored continuously and their brightness must be measured once every few hours. And the ability to continuously view stars being monitored uh, dictates that the field of view must never be blocked by the sun or the earth. So what it did was it looked, if you've got the plane of the ecliptic where all the planets are and the sun and everything, it looked up out of the plane of the ecliptic. So Kepler had, like many spacecraft, they use reaction wheels to maintain proper orientation. They're fantastic devices when they work. Kepler had four of these guys, and after just four years, two of them failed, and one of the four was there for redundancy. So now we've got a pointing problem. So they were looking at you know, this multi-million billion dollar telescope being a piece of space jump. Well, what they did was they figured out a way to save it. Mission planners were able to compensate using an ingenious method. They balanced Kepler against light pressure from the solar wind. And Kepler needed, Kepler, what, instead of looking at that one spot all the time, it needed to burn propellant and, and maintain its orientation. So it looked for one spot for a while and looked for another spot for a while. So if you look, at the plot in NASA eyes on exoplanet, you'll see this huge splotch where it found all of them, and then you'll see little arms coming out of it all over the place, and we've discovered exoplanets all over the sky. So Kepler retired in 2018 uh, after nine years in deep space. Uh, it ran out of fuel, and uh, so they they end of life in the end of life and. There's Kepler by the numbers, lots of exoplanets, lots of data, and had that three gallons of fuel. That doesn't seem like much, but yikes. So it is a fantastic telescope, <clears throat> and they are still discovering candidates from its data. Kepler 186F, the first Earth sized exoplanet discovered in the potentially habitable zone around another star where liquid water could exist. The star is much cooler and redder than our sun, and if plant light does exist on Kepler 186f, its photosynthesis could have been influenced by the star's red wavelength, making for a color palette that's very different from the greens on Earth. So Kepler, uh, like Luke Skywalker's Tatooine in Star Wars, Kepler 16b orbits two stars. But Kepler 16b is a gas giant like Saturn, so you're not going to stand on that. So this this the travel poster is from one of its moons, and so NASA has a lot of these travel posters. These, these look great on your wall. A team of transatlantic scientists using reanalyzed data from Kepler have discovered an Earth-sized exoplanet orbiting in its star's habitable zone. <clears throat> they discovered this planet, uh, Kepler 1649c, when looking through old observations. And they, uh, previous searches with a computer al algorithm misidentified it. This artist impression shows what it looked like to the surface of this planet. So this young lady, a high school student, developed a mathematical model that calculated there could be as many as 560 of these types of hidden planets. And she identified 96 areas of the sky that they might be found. She won a huge award for this, and she's become pretty famous in the exoplanet uh, circles on, on Twitter. <clears throat> the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, launched in 2018. Uh, this is the uh, successor to the Kepler Space Telescope. Whereas Kepler was looking at one area, TESS looks at the entire uh, sky. And during its two-year primary mission, which is now over, it monitored more than 200,000 pre-selected stars and detected over 1,900 exoplanet candidates. Uh, it's on an extended mission, and it's continuing to monitor our stellar neighborhood. And heaven knows how long it'll keep going. So there's by the numbers. And again, this, this, is, this, is, this is not end of mission. This is still actively looking for exoplanets. So the James Webb Space Telescope, pretty pretty darn famous, uh, launched in 2021. Uh, this is the image from NASA Eyes on the Solar System. And when I saw the pink color 
for the web there. I thought there was something wrong with my monitor or my graphics card. I, I reconnected things. I, re, I updated my graphics software. I'm like, what is going on? So I looked it up. Nope, it's pink. Uh, the pink hue is from uh, the coating on the sun shield. You don't normally see that pink color when you see web, but yeah, it's pink. <laughs> It's named after James Webb, who was the second administrator of NASA. Uh, there's its travel poster. Uh, it is a true technological marvel, and I'm not going to go through all this because this is all just uh, <laughs> propaganda from NASA, but it's, it's an amazing telescope. It's doing amazing science. It is taking, uh, this is, it is taking, spec, it's doing spectroscopy on found exoplanets. So this one is WASP-96b. It took the atmospheric composition, and we're seeing more and more and more of these happening. And there was a recent, uh, I didn't actually put this in here, there was a recent uh, announcement of some discovery around an exoplanet. And the next thing you know, they're saying that they discovered life. No, they've not discovered life around an exoplanet, around an exoplanet. So here's more, more, more spectra. So that uh, the James Webb is just doing crazy. So this is the Ring Nebula. This is one of the latest image from the James Webb. Yeah, now get a, get a load. Isn't that gorgeous? That that is just absolutely beautiful. That that's on the back of my screen as, as the screensaver as the, as the desktop background. So uh, there is a documentary on Netflix called Unknown, the Cosmic Time Machine, and it goes through all of the points of failure that could have happened during the deployment of the James Webb. So this goes through from launch to deployment and shows you everything that's going on. That's free on Netflix right now. So what's going on in the future? Well, we've got uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. This is formerly WFIRST, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. Its goal is to search for extrasolar planets using gravitational microlensing, along with probing the chronology of the universe and the growth of cos the cosmic stru structure and the end goal of measuring the effects of dark energy. So it's going to be doing a whole lot of different things. And that's what, a couple of years from now. I've seen several different things about stuff like this, about different concepts of modular self-assembling space swarms. You could make a telescope as big as you want with something like this. And as I said, I, I've seen several different concepts, but if you have swarms of micro telescopes that can put themselves together, how big do you want your telescope? That's an interesting concept. Um, this is the star shade. It, this, uh, this thing that's unfolding like origami is actually positioned like tens of thousands of kilometers away from, from the, the telescope section here. And that the two point, uh, it's got a 2.4 meter mirror. Uh, that thing blocks out the star's light. And the reason it's shaped like that is because it, it, it filters out light that can bend around it. It's a crazy concept. Again, mad science. The Giant Magellan Telescope. This is a 25.4 meter ground-based telescope under construction in Chile. Uh, it is expected to have a resolving power 10 times that of the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's ground-based. And four times that of the James Webb, although it will be unable to image in the same infrared frequencies due to our atmosphere. The 30 meter telescope is planned. Uh, it's controversial due to its location in Mauna Kea. The TMT would become the largest visible light telescope on Mauna Kea. NASA's uh, LUVOR. This thing kind of looks like the James Webb Space Telescope, but it's much bigger. It, the sun shield is very much the same, but it, it got, it, it's, it's huge. So, our, our last presentation uh, uh, at Macomb, we had a lady come in and talk about citizen science. Well, there is, uh, is a whole bunch of citizen science that you can do with exoplanets. Uh, you can, you can uh, look for exoplanets with all these different uh, packages. Some of them are from NASA, some are from, are from um, uh, Universe. 
that uh, that be the citizen science uh, website with a whole bunch of different projects that you can get involved with. So in closing, <clears throat> children of today, like my granddaughter here, you know, I have to in every one of my lectures for some reason. So my granddaughter will never know a night sky that is filled with worlds, and there's never going to be uh, a shortage of them to discover. But but we haven't found another Earth yet. So this Earth we have here is pretty special. It's the only home we know. We need to take care of it as best as we can for ourselves and for future generations and the countless species that call Earth home. And thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, yes. I found you said that I had that. Hmm. Earth, Earth side. They're looking for Earth. They're looking for oxygen. They haven't found that yet. They're looking for signs of life. Probably that lose lore, but James Webb's going to be around a while. I yeah, con concept designs for the Lubor include a 15 meter or an 8 meter mirror on this thing, which is big. Yes. We've only found one in another galaxy. I'm sure that number is going to increase, but uh, yeah, we're looking. Space is big and there's a lot of stars near us to look at. Any other questions? Well, I'm sorry, what was the question? 51 Pegasus CB? It's, uh, well, how far away? I don't know how far away it is. Come on. Um, I should put that in my lecture, shouldn't I? The tome of all knowledge, fifty-one Pegasi B distance, fifty light years away. I love being able to ask this thing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, any any there are any number of things that I had in this lecture that you could do an entire lecture on in its own, like spectroscopy or. You know, and, and any any one of these individual uh, space missions could do, do a fifteen minute lecture. So just think about that. If you're if you're if you if you find something that catches your interest, think about doing a short lecture on it. You enjoy, you enjoy it. The first time you do it, you're going to be scared. After that, look at me. Do I look scared? Not anymore. All right. So if there are no more questions, then uh, we're pretty much going to pack it up here. So our next meeting is in person at Macomb Community College South Campus, October 19th. Uh, our next open house and star party is at Stargate on October 